already go. Oh, okay. So hopefully it will continue. Okay. And it's a very great pleasure to be here on this but very special occasion and uh, it's amazing what's also like this energetic and inspirational feel that you have set up and that we're sitting here and that we are talking about our future. So that's very humbling and very inspiring to see. I want to talk about one of the major projects we're currently working on as the Club of Budapest Germany. And I'm representing that here, and uh, I came here together with Peter Spiegel, who is sitting over there. Uh, and uh, some of you know Peter already, because he has been a very active member. In fact, he has been the Secretary General in the years between 2002 and 2005. He has also been publishing several of uh, Evan Laszlo's books. And he has been the initiator of the current project, the Future Skills Project, that we are working on. And that is something I would like to deep dive a little bit uh, now and tell you more about what this is about. Future skills, and that is what uh, also Erwin said about it, are the practical expression of what he calls the new mindset. So that is what we need for the future, and it's basically entailing this paradigm shift that we need in order to move to transition to a world we want to live in. And what it is about, and why we are building this platform to get together people to basically reconnect to what it means to be human, but not just human, but be human on a planet, in a planetary system. That is something that is deep in our hearts and that is something that is very important to us. To get there, maybe a few words about myself. My name is Arndt, and I, being maybe not even at half of my lifetime on my physical body, uh, I see myself as a bridge between three things. First of all, a bridge between generations. And while I see most of us here be maybe in the second half of their lives, I really find it very, very crucial that we also connect to the young generation because they are the ones who are actually now also shaping our planet and that we need to get along this amazing journey and this uh, challenging journey that we have, but also, as I see it, as one of the greatest opportunities in humanity where we actually have to act, but where we have means in our hands that we never had before in our hands to do change. The second thing is being a bridge between subjects. We need to break boundaries between different disciplines, between the silos of thinking, be it social science, be it uh, science, like natural science, be it uh, philosophy, be it technical stuff, being really economy and all these things, we need to break these silos in order to work on the future. And the third bridge I want to build is the bridge that I myself, and I will talk a bit about it, coming from science, coming from academia, is to break this or build the bridge between academic knowledge and reaching out to the people who don't have an academic background. Because if we want to make a change in the world, we need to reach everyone. And we cannot reach them just by data and by huge analytics and reports because for most people this is not accessible. So we need to build this bridge, we need to be inclusive about that as well. And that was one of the main reasons why I diverted a little bit in my academic journey. I originally come from a biochemical background, from neuroscience, I did my PhD in learning and memory. And I was working in neuroscience for almost 10 years at various institutions in Europe and the US. And I love how our brain is set up, but it's a very analytical way how we look at our brain. And the problem with that is that we miss out on the huge potential that we have behind that, because it's not about the accumulation of knowledge. What we are lacking is to make wisdom and apply wisdom to the knowledge we already have. And that was one of the reasons why I thought it needs to be more than just science. And I reconnected to some of my passions, which is being out in nature loving biological systems, and I stumbled upon a topic that is what can we learn from biological systems, namely from nature, and bring it back into human problem solving, a field called biomimicry. What can we learn from complex adaptive systems, because they have been existing for billions of years, and that is what we need to reconnect to in order to solve the problems and challenges that we're facing today. And that needs to be connected then to change our systems, to change our organizations, to change our societies in a way that needs to follow different methods and approaches. We cannot only do this in a scientific and analytic way. We need more agile, we need, need more experimental ways, intuitive ways of doing that. And finally, we need to connect to technology. 
but not seeing technology as the one thing that can solve our future, but just as an enabler and as an accelerator, but only if we decide to use it in a responsible, responsible way. And these are the things we try to bring together. And that is more urgent now than it has ever been before in human history, for various reasons. And one of the main reasons is that we are currently on a trajectory that is exponential in many ways because of exponential technologies, because of the synergies and the accumulation of natural and planetary tipping points that we are crossing or have already crossed, because of social networks, because of globalization, all that moves along an exponential path. The challenge we are facing is that with our individual and analytical mind, we are only capable of linear thinking. We can only predict how the future can be, and we talked about scenarios, we talked about analytics and prediction before today. We can only do that in a linear way, and we will derive our predictions based on the experiences of the present and the past. But if we want to design and shape the future, we have to move beyond that linear thinking. That is clearly moved up, because the gap between what we think will happen and what actually happens grows wider and wider. So therefore, it is not that we talked about these black swans, about these uh, unexpected events that happen in, like in, in denser and denser um, uh, population. We cannot solve these things and predict these things in old ways. We have to work in different ways. It's not the disruption and the turbulence per se, but it is the problem is to act with yesterday's logic. So we have to embark on a new, more informed, and a more hybrid way of solving the challenges of today. And therefore, tradition is not a business model. Tradition is not a business model. That doesn't mean that everything that is old is bad, but it means that just because it has always been that way, it's not a guarantee, it's valid for the future. So we need to be critical, and we need to challenge everything we do through the eyes and the lens of today's needs, and tomorrow's needs especially. And that is something that is fundamental. We are stuck societally and politically in a system that is building on endless growth. And we all know that since 72, the latest, we know that this is nothing that is working on the finite planet, that this growth is not working. We are now in a phase of stagnation, in many ways, of disruption. This is where we are. And we all feel and know that this bifurcation, this way where we can move into two directions, one is, we continue doing the same thing that we've been doing for the last decades. We all know, in some way or the other, this will lead to some kind of collapse. The other way is, we can iterate, we can reorganize, and we can shape and shift to a new paradigm, what you call the upshift. So this is something that is fundamentally needed, but this is radically possible, and this is the great thing. This is something I call hybrid thinking. We need to hybridize different aspects of our world that are there. It's, everything is there, we just need to connect it. We need to break the boundaries between the different things. There's a term for it, how we often describe the current situation. It's called VUCA. Maybe some of you know it, maybe some of you don't. VUCA is an acronym, so it's made up of the first letters of the following four aspects. The V stands for volatility, so meaning Everything is in change, and constantly, and to ever faster changing. That means that we cannot make static plans, we cannot make long-term plans, we cannot control things, because what we think will happen tomorrow, or in half a year from now, might not ever happen, because things constantly change. This leaves us with what you stand for, uncertainty. For the fact that we cannot plan, that we cannot predict the future, we feel uncomfortable. Also, complexity increases immensely, more and more. And that means that we need to think in systems. And lastly, because there are so many possibilities, we need to deal with ambiguity. That means, depending on which information we have, we come to different conclusions. And the decisions we take today may differ tomorrow already because we have a new set of information. And that very often is perceived and also communicated as something very negative. It's negative to communicate. But that's reality we're living in. And whether or not something is negative or positive is a matter of definition for ourselves and for society. The problem, if we only connotate this negatively, 
we are stuck in. This is what mass media does all the time. It basically feeds us with negative news. What's not working? What's bad? But that leaves us in the state of learned helplessness. We learn to not be able to do anything anymore. And we give up. We are all in this collective paralysis. What we need to do is to activate our human potential. And that is something that we try to do with the hyperthinking approach. To reframe this reality and give it a new meaning. So if everything is volatile, if everything is changing, what we need is a vision, is this positive future vision that we want to be in. We have enough dystopias that we don't want, but we have very few, if any, visions where we want to. And what we do with this vision is we activate people, we bring them together, we share values and future images. And that is something that sparks and requires curiosity and courage. But collectively, courage is much easier. And we need courageous future visions. We need this moonshot thinking. You all remember in the 60s when Kennedy said he wanted to go in that decade to the moon. And it was impossible back then. In the early 60s, it was simply impossible. But by staying in and creating this vision, it made it possible. And when we talk about climate action now, it's not enough to just say we want to be less bad. We want to save carbon dioxide. If we just want to be less bad, we will not even achieve that. What we need is a <laughs> courageous and bold vision to say we want to be beneficial and not just not harmful. We need to be contributing to a better future and not just less damaging. This is the first thing. And when we do this, when we want to achieve this, we need to combine different aspects. We need to combine the human aspect. So how can we create well-being for people we need to talk about planetary well-being, because without that, which is our home, which is our fundamental requirement for our survival and living and thrival, we cannot do it. So respect the planetary boundaries and learn from living systems. And we need to use technologies in a meaningful and responsible way. If we do that, then we have great chances to change the future. The second aspect then is, if we are living in a world that creates uncertainty, one way of taking people along is we need to upskill them. We need to make them agents of change. Not that change happens to them and they are overwhelmed, but we need to activate them to become agents of change. They need to be empowered. And we need to reactivate our intrinsic and most fundamental skill of learning. And that is where our future skill project is living in. If you look at education, that for most of us, if you think about learning, is we think about schools first, because that is how we were conditioned. We were mostly not educated, we were conditioned in a very standardized system. This is how computer technology looked like in 1945, first computer. This is how computer technology looks today. Artificial intelligence, cloud computing, blockchain, all these things, interconnected cloud-based solutions. And quantum leap in evolution. If you look at schooling, this is how schooling looked in 1945. This is how schooling looks today, at least in Germany. And this is only if you're lucky. Most schools do not have computers in front of computers. And just putting a computer in front of a student doesn't make it future ready. It's still the old formats. It's still someone preaching and teaching. It's still a very standardized and very practical and very analytical approach. No one teaches us about love and compassion. No one teaches us about global consciousness. We learn arithmetic, we learn statistics, we learn language, but these are all analytical skills that I can, to some extent, measure, but all the human traits are barely, if at all, taught in school. So is that really education we can afford in the 21st century? And we believe not. Because if you ask a pupil today why they attend school, they will say, because I have to. Because at least in Germany, it's by the law that you have to go to school. What if we create learning places, which are exceptional places where you learn and experience something that you can learn nowhere else, that is additional to your social environment where you live outside school? So, what we need for the first time in humankind is not only experts, but we need learners. And the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those people who can read and write and calculate, but those who can learn unlearn and relearn. And this is the basis of what we call a new humanism. This is the age of a new humanism. 
And this is where actually technology, this is a very interesting thing. Very often, again, we are taught that technology is so dangerous, it takes away our jobs, it takes away our humanity. We think it's the opposite. Of course, everything that can be automated and digitized will be. It's just a question of time. But that also means, and this is a great thing, that everything that cannot be automated and digitized will be extremely valuable. And all these things that are deeply humane, that we don't even know of or cannot measure, cannot be automated. They are within us, and we don't use them. So this aspect of the human inside, this is something that we need to learn and reconnect to, that we had as babies and that we lost running through an education or a conditioning system. And that is something that we want to tackle. This is why we are so passionate about our future skills. And future skills is something that needs to connect the foundational literacies like reading and writing and digital literacies and all these things that we need nowadays with future literacies to have this understanding of shaping the future and personal qualities like courage and uh, all these things, patience and all these things and then bind them into a future skills framework that then leads to three things to personal well-being, to societal well-being and to planetary well-being that we call life ability. So not just sustainability, we don't just want to sustain, we want to create life, we want to contribute to life in order to live in the future that we want to live in. And just to give you an outlook and this uh, white paper, this report will appear in a few weeks from now, we see these future skills not only in the rational part, like our schooling system and most, if you look at organizations, they only teach on rational aspects. To be a whole human being, of course you need rational skills, but you also need emotional skills. We also are spiritual beings, we need spiritual uh, skills. And, and especially in the 21st century, we need to learn about transformational skills. How can we use our humankind, our human being, our human essence to transform others, to transform our future in a positive way? And this needs to be interconnected. And that is something that we need to empower people with, to upskill them, to shape the future. Well, and complexity, and this is based on systems theory and game theory, complexity can only be tackled by collaboration and diversity. You can only solve a complex problem by using complex solution systems. And therefore we need collaboration, we need transparency. This is fundamental, we need to connect, we need to co-create. We need to have multi-perspectivity, again another future skill, in order to shape our future. And we need to move out of this 20th century mindset of the IQ. We created a standardized instrument to measure by number people's intelligence. It's so absurd to compare people by a number with an intelligence quotient. And we need to move to something that Peter created as a wordplay collective or the collaborative intelligence, the wiki, that is so much deeper, that is so much more powerful and that is something that we're aspiring to do. Because if we can do this, and only if we can do this, then we are able to solve that dilemma. As individuals with our linear thinking, we're stuck in failing to predict the future. As collective and collaborative intelligence, we are able to create the future collective. And that is what we are after. And finally, and with that I'm coming to the end, how do we deal with ambiguity? Ambiguity requires adaptation and agility. And therefore, you need systems thinking, and we need to have responsibility towards everything we do, and the future we create, and the legacy we leave. So that leaves us with thinking in ecosystems, thinking in systems, and moving out of this scarcity mindset, this no because, and finding arguments why tradition is maybe good, moving towards what if, opening potentials, the questions you were talking about, not closing down, but opening up opportunities. That is what we need. And we need to be courageous, and it links back to the vision, to maybe create things that make old things obsolete. Sometimes it's not enough to just optimize an old thing. It's not good enough to repair things that are broken, Sometimes you just need to create something new that makes the old one obsolete. So this is what we call future skills embedded into the hybrid thinking concept. And you see, you need all four. You need the vision, the why. You need the upskilling, the who, the people. You need the how, which is the collaboration. And you need the what, the adaptation, the agility. Only then we can transform. We can make that shift. 
and we are ready for the future. If we leave out the vision, we will create confusion and frustration. And that's what we are seeing often. We don't have visions in organizations and society. And we see a lot of polarization and resignation at the same time. If you leave out the upskilling, you create fear and resistance. We can observe that as well, so we need to work on that. If you leave out the collaboration, you create competition and inefficiencies. And if you leave out the adaptation, it will lead to disruption and maybe possibly a partial or complete collapse. So all of these four are needed and that is what we are on. So the vision, the upskilling, the collaboration and the agility. This is what we are so passionate about. This is only in German so far. We have published a book on that with 32 uh, skills. We are working on more, but uh, we are working on a platform and we are working on this in an international version. And this is what we're passionate about. Thank you very much, and we are happy to be here.